Hello class, welcome to day 5A, which is Communication Skills, Chapter 3. As usual, um, open to Section 2 of Chapter 3, um, that starts with uh, explain types of communication. We know that communication is the key to every relationship, whether it's professional or personal. You have to communicate. That's how you know what the other person needs, especially in this case where you're the caregiver and you're providing care to a resident. You have to know and understand when they need assistance. So let's uh, begin. So there are two types of communications. Number one is verbal communication, which involves everything spoken, everything written, email, uh, texts, all of that are considered verbal communication. Number two, nonverbal communication. That's when you only use your body language to convey a message to the other person. For example, you walk into a room, the resident uh, is crying or is sad. They're not saying anything to you. But you can tell by their body language that something is wrong. So that's communication. That's nonverbal communication. So like we said, body language, all the conscious or unconscious ways that people make their faces, make their body, position themselves, that sends a message to the other person. It could be positive message, it could be negative message. It depends on the body language. Then active listening, very important in every communication. You must listen actively. That's the only way you're going to understand what the other person is saying. So this is giving your undivided attention when the other person is speaking. So we know that communication is an exchange of information. Resident sends information to you, you receive the information and you, you, know, you send a feedback so that you know, you know that the communication was received and it was understood. So let's look at this picture here. So let's say this is uh, Susie uh, after she gets old and then the caregiver. So the resident sees the caregiver and sends a message and says, how are you? He receives a message and responds, fine, and you? with a question. And, we, and we, so we do this all the time with our text messages. How are you? Fine. And you? But then that's the end of the communication. See, there is nothing else. Let's go back. Well, that's incomplete communication. Why? Okay, let's, let's look at it. There was no feedback from her to and you with a question mark. He responded to her message by saying, fine, I'm fine. Then he asked her how she was doing, and you, but there's no response. So what could be the issues here? And what else should be done to make sure communication is complete? We know this, this looks like a resident. The way she's holding her head, she may have hearing problem. Maybe her hearing aid is not turned on, you know? It doesn't seem like she's having an attitude and doesn't want to talk to him because she was the one that first said hello to him and asked him how he was doing. So what should he do, especially as a caregiver who needs the information from the resident more than the resident needs information from you, the caregiver? Should he have gone closer to make sure that she heard him? Should he uh, repeat himself again? And, and, or should he go maybe, you know, hold her hand and say, Miss Susie, I was asking you how you were doing, just to make sure the communication is complete and to make sure she's okay because if she might say she's not okay, she might need water, she might need help with something. Um, but 
if you just leave the communication as it is, then it's incomplete and he doesn't know if she need help or not. So we talk about communication, verbal communication. Remember how you sound when you speak to someone is just as important to the words that you're using. So what if I'm yelling at you? I am teaching, but I'm screaming. Would that be appropriate communication? No. What if your supervisor is trying to give you information about policy or something you did wrong or maybe some new information, but he's screaming or he's yelling? Then the information might not be well received. You might not be paying attention to the contents of my teaching because I'm yelling. That now makes you start thinking, oh, why is he yelling? And then that will distract you from learning. So it's very important that the voice, the tone, be appropriate to the words that you're using. You cannot say, so, you cannot say hello to someone, but you sound like you're mad. Then the hello will not mean anything to the person. So body language is very important. And sometimes we do it consciously. Sometimes we do it unconsciously. Okay. Here's another picture here about body language. We see that the lady doesn't look like she's scolding him, but he looks like he's afraid or he's scared or he's in trouble. But it just seems like the lady is just talking to him, trying to encourage him. She doesn't look mad. So sometimes body language can be misinterpreted. So you have to be careful. Yes, body language can be positive, body language can be negative. So you have to know that your body language, your facial expression is appropriate to your tone, to your voice. Examples of positive nonverbal communication. You're smiling in a friendly manner. You lean forward and pay attention while the other person is talking or teaching. Like I'm teaching you, um, I expect you to be nodding your head, to pay uh, attention. And then if you need to ask a question, you put your hand up and ask a question. Now, let's take a look at negative body language. You're rolling your eyes as I'm speaking to you or your supervisor is speaking to you. That's very disrespectful. You cross your hands or you're tapping your feet or you're talking to someone and you're pointing a finger at the person. That's very unprofessional. You don't do that. So always think of um, other positive ways that you can um, add to your communication skills. I'll tell you a quick story. I was in court. Uh, it was a divorce, uh, divorce court uh, with my ex-wife. I'm sitting on my section in the courtroom and she's sitting in her section. The chair was very comfortable, uh, one of these swinging chairs. So while she was giving her testimony, I was sitting there, my legs were open. I you know, crossed my hands and I was swinging from side to side. I didn't know I was annoying the judge. It was a female judge. So when she's talking, when she says something that wasn't true, I'll make my face, I'll turn and look at her and I make my face. And when it was my turn to speak, I finished and I was telling everything truthfully. But at the end of the case, uh, the judge said she did not believe a word that I said because I was being disrespectful. I said, Your Honor, how was I disrespectful? I was telling you the truth. She said, you sat there with your legs open, swinging from side to side, and when you were talking to me, you were not making eye contact. So when I was speaking to her, you know, I was not like making eye contact with her. Again, you, uh, some of you know that from our um, upbringing in, in, in Africa, we're not supposed to look at people in authority or elderly people in their face, in their eyes. Um, up until my father passed uh, last month, I never looked at him in the eye when I was speaking. You know, she said to me, the judge said to me, 
how long have you been in the United States? So don't give me that uh, my culture thing. You're here now when you're speaking or you're giving testimony, testimony, you look at me in the face, in the eye, so I can know whether you're lying or not. You don't put your face down. So my body language killed my case that day. But I learned my lesson. In the next hearing, I sat at the table, I folded my leg. I mean, I didn't cross my leg, but I put my legs together. I put my hands on the table. I had my pen and paper. When she said something, I took notes. When it was my time to speak, I uh, looked at the judge in the eye. And, and that's how they tell whether you're telling the truth or not. They, you know, it's not scientific, but it's just psychological. So you have to understand those things. They might think you're lying because you're not looking at them in the face especially some of you or anyone that will be going to interview with immigration or wherever, make sure um, as you're communicating, you, you come across as being trustworthy, believable and all that. So make that eye contact, have a friendly uh, face, a smiley face, and that will help, uh, help you a lot. So in communication, you must use appropriate language. You cannot be speaking Ebonics or, or, or slangs or street language while you're you know, communicating in, a, in an official capacity. Be aware of your body language. Use friendly professional tone or voice. Wait for responses. Pause as you're speaking in case someone wants to ask you a question. Don't go on and on and on and on and on and on without pause. You know, we call it radio, <laughs> radio without battery. Just keep going. Use mostly facts when you're communicating. You may forget some things, maybe time that something happened, but try to be as factual as possible. So use verbal and nonverbal communication to reach your goal. Like in my case, I was able to adjust the way I spoke and the way I, uh, I acted, my body language in my second case. Uh, and by the way, at the end of the whole thing, I, was, I, I succeeded in uh, achieving what I wanted out of that case. We know that there are barriers to communication, lots of barriers. So a barrier is a block or an obstacle that prevents communication from flowing. So you're going to encounter a lot of barriers, especially in this field. Some of your co-workers don't speak English. Some of the residents don't speak English. Um, some of them don't can't uh, speak at all. Maybe they have a trick. Um, so you have to know how to communicate with them. They may, they may have respiratory problem. So it could be a lot of reasons or they, can, or they just can no longer speak or respond. They may have Alzheimer's or they may have other uh, medical condition that um, prevent them from speaking. So how will you communicate with them? So these are some of the barriers. Words that are not understood. Don't use big words. I know people that, uh, some of us that uh, have a, a, a English background, um, we, we like to use a lot of isms and idioms and big words. Not here in America. Keep it simple. All right, so that the other person can understand you. Remember, we're already speaking with an accent. So when you're talking to uh, the resident, you have an accent, number one. Number two, if you're using big words, that makes it worse. When you're communicating, don't use why. Um, a lot. Don't say why are you this or why that. Just try to keep the, the uh, communication open. Nonverbal communication that we talked about earlier. You walk into a residence room, you say hi, but then you look mad. Maybe your spouse or your children or your neighbor or somebody upset you at home. Well, keep it out of the facility. When you report to work, you're supposed to be friendly and smiling, especially you walk into their room. I had, a, I had an occasion as a charge nurse where this uh, CNA had floated from another unit to come to my unit to work. 
I assigned her, gave her her assignment. So as she's making rounds, she walked into the room, said hello to the resident, and just by saying hello, the resident looked at her and said, I don't want you to take care of me. Go and call the charge nurse. So she came and called me. I went into the room. I said, uh, Miss, Miss Susie, what's wrong? She said, she looked mean. I said, but um, what do you mean she looked mean? She said, she came in here. I said, didn't she say hello to you? She said, yeah, yeah, she said hello, but she looked mean. Some people carry their face as if they are angry, but that's just how they are. Don't expect people to adjust to how you are. You need to adjust to what is normal, what is general. And what is normal is for you to have a friendly look on your face. Okay? And by the way, we all look prettier and more handsome when we smile. So put a smile on your face. Cliché. Cliché. Um, an example of a cliché is when... For example, maybe, maybe a resident is feeling sick and you go and say to the resident, oh, don't worry, God will, God will heal you. That's a cliche. We all, you know, as Christians and religious people, we uh, believe in God to heal and we say that a lot. Uh, don't worry, God will take care of it. But not all the time. <laughs> you don't know that God will take care of it in this case. So it's a cliche. Uh, because he doesn't always take care of it you know there are other reasons but we don't we don't understand all of it but don't say to a resident oh don't worry god will take care of it that's a cliche yes or no answers ends a conversation if you ask a resident how are you are you okay and they say yes well that's not the way to find out about the resident Ask the resident, well, how was your day today? What did you have for dinner? Is there anything that you need me to do for you? Or um, you know, how was your care this morning? Then she might start explaining more, you know, instead of just yes or no. Slangs that I used. Every, every city, every culture, every country have their own slangs. The slangs you have from Cameroon or Ghana or Nigeria, they don't have the slangs here. Don't use slangs. Um, New York have their own slangs. Baltimore have their own slangs. California and Los Angeles have their own slangs. So be careful when you're using slangs because the resident might not understand you. Never give an advice. Don't say, oh, I use this particular medication or I use this method of treatment and it worked for me. You're not a doctor. Let the resident's doctor handle the resident's medical condition. Um, don't pray for them. You're not, uh, if you're a prayer warrior in your church, well, pray for your church members and your family and your friends. Don't pray for the residents. If they need prayers, you report that to the charge nurse. The charge nurse will inform the, the social worker. They will arrange for prayers that the family wants, not your prayers. Unless if you're doing one-on-one, -on -one, the family okays you to pray for them or the family okays you to take them to your church, then you can do that. A resident speaks another language. This is a big one. You know, you have residents that speak Spanish, French, Greek, uh, Russian, Italian. Well, you have to know the policy of your facility as to how to communicate with those residents. There is an interpre interpretation line where you have, uh, we have that, my job, uh, you have this phone system that have two receivers. So you pick up one receiver, it automatically dial the language uh, interpretation of that resident. Then you, you, you pick up the other receiver and, and hand it to the resident. So you will now speak English to the person on the other end of the phone. The person will interpret to the resident and then the resident will speak the language to the person, to the, to the interpreter. The interpreter will now speak to you in, in English. So you now can go back and forth about that. So um, CNA, 
cannot understand the resident. So you can't understand the resident. Again, you have to find ways to make sure that you and the residents are communicating well. So we talk about all these barriers to communication and you have to um, make sure that you understand. Now imagine a day of life without communication, how would that feel? So think of a situation which you wasted time and effort because of miscommunication. Miscommunication happens a lot. I'll give an example. I mean, by now you know I tell a lot of stories. So, so my wife and I, um, you know, she was complaining, oh, it's been a long time, we don't go to the movies, we haven't gone out, and you know, you know how our spouses complain sometimes. I said, okay, fine. Uh, this was like on a, on a Tuesday or a Wednesday. We're both off that weekend, and I said, okay, on Saturday evening at seven, we'll go to the movies. And I left the room. I didn't know she didn't hear me. So Saturday came around five o'clock. I said, honey, um, can we start getting ready so we can go to the movies? She was like, what movies? I said, remember on, on Wednesday I told you we're, we're gonna go to the movies on Saturday at seven? when you were complaining that we don't go to the movies. He said, me, you told me we we're going to the movies. No, you didn't. I said, yes, I did. She said, no, you didn't. And guess what? We we're both right. I said it. She did not hear. So to her, I didn't say it. So what did I do wrong in that communication? I did not wait to get her okay. I did not make sure that she heard me. Because she asked me, okay, if you told me, what did I say? Because I did not get her feedback to make sure it was okay. I didn't know she had her appointment at seven that Saturday evening. So she was like, I made an appointment at uh, seven to do my hair. So I don't know what you're talking about. You told me about a movie. So I, we wasted that time, uh, you know. So when you're communicating with someone make sure that the person heard you get a feedback from the person okay sometimes repeat what they have said if they are giving you the information to confirm that you know that's exactly what um, they have said culture like i said earlier there are cultural differences and barriers to communication one culture um, don't look at people in the eye when they're speaking. Another culture is the opposite. If you don't look at people in the eye when you're speaking, they think you're lying. So imagine that. So you're coming from one culture, you're going to another culture, you have to understand the differences. So like I said, eye contact, touch. Some cultures, the way they greet is to kiss on the cheek, you know, on one side and the other side. Other cultures, you dare not touch the person. So language uh, differences, you know, <clears throat> so you have to understand the differences in culture and behaviors. So some cultures don't accept touch, some do, like we said. Now you have to be careful when it comes to touching. Um, you don't want to be accused of sexual harassment, okay? Never sit on a resident's lap, and they should not sit on your lap either. Never kiss a resident. There is an appropriate hug, and there is an inappropriate hug. You can hug a resident on the shoulder, just put your arm around them for a second, and take it off, and that's it. But don't go stand face to face and put, wrap your hands around the resident as if the resident is your girlfriend or wife. That will not be appropriate, so be very careful. As a matter of fact, even when you're greeting another staff at the facility, so be careful even with your colleagues. So think of acceptable and unacceptable uh, touching and hugging, okay? Whatever is appropriate in your culture, well, <clears throat> when, you are the when you are the facility, you're going by the culture of here and your facility policy regarding those type of things. So we are still talking about communications and remember that you must communicate as a nursing assistant to several people. 
but you have to be careful who you communicate with. You can never communicate personal information about the residents to your friends or family. That will be against the law. There's a HIPAA law against that. But you must communicate with the doctors, with the nurses, supervisor, any staff member who has a direct care responsibility to that resident, the social worker, the dietitian, they, want, they might want to know how they're eating. Um, <clears throat> family and friends of the resident might come in to visit. They, are, they can ask you, well, how has she been doing? You can say, okay, she's been doing fine. That's okay. He, but if they say, oh, when is her next dental appointment? You cannot answer that. That's personal and private information about the resident's health. Only the uh, responsible party or the legal guardian of the resident can have such information, not even the other family members. I had a situation where this resident had five daughters. Only the second daughter was the legal guardian. But the third daughter was the one that came frequently. She always come every day. The second daughter whose legal guardian lives in Baltimore, so she only comes once in a while. But that's the only one we can give information to. So this third daughter will always come in and say, oh, when is my mom going, uh, going on her dental appointment, eye appointment, because I want to go with her. Well, we couldn't tell her that. And she was always very upset with us. We will always say to her, please, you have to ask your sister. We cannot give you that information unless you're listed as the legal guardian. And a resident can have, you know, one main legal guardian and a second legal guardian and a second guardian that is authorized to have information. But the first legal guardian has to give that permission. Edema means swelling of the body, tissues caused by excessive fluid, roots, prefix, and suffix. Those are all parts of words and, you know, that changes the meaning, the beginning of the beginning of a word and ending of a word. So we're not going to go into that as much. Abbreviations, we're going to cover that in a separate class. Communication in terms of regular time and military time. Some facilities use 24 hour clock, you know, they say you know, 2300, 1400, 1700. But you have to know what that means in terms of regular clock. So let's look at it. So we know now, we know here that if the clock is at 3.30, that means 15, 30. Okay, so 3.30 a.m. will mean, will still be in 3.30 in military time. It will be 0330. Three, but if it is 3.30 in the afternoon, it will be 15.30. Okay, so understand all of that. Medical chart, part of their record where you have information. The medical chart have all their information, medical history, family um, contact information, all of that. Charting just means documentation. You know, as CNS, you'll be documenting and charting on care that you provide. How much they ate, whether they, how much they drank, if they had a bowel movement, if they um, had urine, and all that. So you have responsibilities. And remember that all of their documents are legal documents. You have to be careful what you write in their, in their chart. So we say that a typical medical uh, chart includes the admission forms, family history, um, care plan, doctor's orders, and uh, assessment, and all of that. Flow sheets, intake and output, all of that. Advanced directive, surgical reports, things, labs, and so on. I said earlier, all residents' information are confidential. So you cannot share information about the resident with anybody else unless those that have direct care responsibility with the resident. So remember that. 
You also have to document accurately, okay? And let's go back. You must only use black ink. No blue, no red, no green. Only black ink. That's the legal color. I guess that's why lawyers wear black and judges. So use facts. Follow your facility policy, uh, policies when you're using abbreviations. Some abbreviations are confusing, but we'll talk more about that in, an, in a separate class. When you're documenting, especially if you're using a computer, you have a, log, a login ID, you have a password. Every time you log into the computer and, and write anything there, your name is stamped. Now, when you finish using the computer, you should log off the computer so that if somebody else wants to use the computer, they have to log in so that their name will be stamped in everything that they, anything that they write. If you don't log off, you leave it and walk away. When the next person comes in and start using the computer, everything that they're doing will have your name on it. Six months later, they call you to answer questions about something that was that you wrote, and then you say, I didn't write that, but then your name is stamped on it. So be very careful. MDS. It stands for minimum data sets, but I am an MDS coordinator at my job. And what we do is to do um, routine assessments. Those assessments means that we have to gather data information from every department, uh, the medications that the resident is taking, the care that was provided by the CNAs, social services, dietitian, uh, physical therapy, rehab, physical, occupational, and speech therapy. We package all this information together if they have a wound. Um, for two reasons, we have to report to the government the status of the resident, okay? Secondly, they use that assessment report to pay the facility. So the care that is being given um, that's how, um, that's what determines the pay that the, the facility gets. So this, the assessments that we do and submit to the government is to report the condition of the resident and also to, to get paid. So it's very important that you report care, you document care accurately. For example, a resident who requires uh, assistance with feeding if you go, if the CNA documents that the resident feeds themselves, two problems. Number one, the resident will not be getting enough food because they can't eat by themselves. Number two, we're not going to be getting paid for assisting to feed the resident. And then we'll be sending false information to the government. If they're being fed, they need assistance to be fed, the government wants to know that, just to know the level of the resident's care. And when we send a bill that we need additional money because we have to feed this resident, they're gonna go back and see, and check and see what the CNA documented. Did the CNA document that the resident was being fed? So if we send a bill saying that we feed the resident, but the CNA documented that the resident feed themselves, then that's a problem. So be very careful when you're documenting. Care plans. Care plans are information that, a plan of care that's developed um, after having a care plan meeting with the family and all departments that have direct care responsibility to find out, with the resident, to find out how to treat the resident. How do they want their food? How do they want activities? Okay, so we have to have a care plan. Objective information, those are information you can see, touch, smell, verify, okay? Subjective information. Well, let's go back to objective. For example, somebody have a fever, you can verify that by checking their temperature to see what the temperature is, what the fever is. Subjective information, information you cannot see, only what is being told to you by the resident. For example, they say they have a headache or they are in pain. You cannot see pain. You cannot measure it scientifically. 
like the temperature. So you have to rely on what they say. So to, to assess for pain, you're gonna ask them, okay, on a scale of one to 10, how severe is your pain? They might say five, they might say nine. Most of them always like to say 10, so they can get that pain medication. Okay, so remember, subjective versus objective. Orientation means that the person is aware of who they are, where they are, and what time it is. Vital signs, vital signs we have, we have a full chapter on vital signs. And if you remember, vital signs measures temperature, pulse, respiration, blood pressure, and pain level. And this is to monitor the functioning of the vital organs, which tells us the state of a person's health. Critical thinking is a process of reasoning and analyzing a situation in order to come up with a solution. Okay, so remember that nursing assistants spend more time with the residents than any other uh, care team member. So most of the time, all other departments is relying on the uh, CNA to get information about the resident. How have they been sleeping? Have they gone to the bathroom? Have they had a bowel movement? How, how, how are they eating? You know, are they in pain? Are they breathing well? So you are the ones to see and notice a problem at the beginning. For another example, they start having redness in their, in their buttocks. You see that because you're washing them, you're cleaning them, and you're turning them. If you don't report it immediately, what's going to happen? It's going to turn to a wound, a big pressure ulcer. Might go to stage two, stage three, and before you know it, there's a big wound on the, on the butt. So be very careful. And report um, anything that you see, any changes you have to report. A cadex is, um, you know, a paper that tells you what to do for the resident. Every aspect of care um, will be on the cadex for that particular resident. Um, whether they need help to feed, what days they take a shower, and um, things like that. So we, you use your senses to communicate. You know, you smell, you see, you touch, you feel, and so on. <clears throat> To describe how to observe and report accurately, we talk about that. Objective information, things you can see. Subjective information, things you cannot see. But you have to report both. Even if you're not sure, you have to report it. So observe a resident accurately, you're checking their vital signs, you're reporting changes, you know, you're asking them questions as well. Again, you have to use critical thinking, you know, you know which involves making careful observations. If you, let's say you're giving them care, you feel their body is warmer than normal, <clears throat> excuse me, what, what, what will you do next? Take the, take the uh, go look for the thermometer and check their temperature to see if they have a fever. So you can report it and they can get care. In signs and symptoms that you should be, you should report right away. Falls, wheezing, difficulty breathing, chest pain, any kind of pain, blood vision, slurred speech. Slurred speech tells you they're about to have a heart attack or a stroke. Vomiting, uh, they're limping, and any kind of, we talk about pain already, changes in vital signs. So be very, very careful. Nursing process is an organized uh, method where uh, it's a five-step method where the nurses assess, diagnose, and this is not the same diagnosis as a doctor's diagnosis. This is nursing diagnosis. Then we plan what to do, and then we implement the plan, and then we evaluate the plan to see, we evaluate the implementation to see whether it's working, if we need to make adjustment, or if the problem has been resolved. Okay, those are the five. We talk about care conference, which is like a care plan. It's a meeting that, uh, the families involved, the residents, all the departments that have direct care with the resident will be in that meeting. Sometimes the CNA is in, the, in that meeting as well. So that's a care conference meeting or a care plan meeting. From that meeting, the plan of care is developed and then you have a care plan. So we talked about the federal law that guides against 
sharing information that you're not supposed to share about a resident. It's called HIPAA. And we'll talk more about HIPAA in another class. An incident is any occurrence or problem that is unexpected, uh, like a fall, for example. Sentinel events is an event that um, occur involving a serious physical or psychological injury or it involves death. Every incident, you must write an incident report. We're going to cover incident report in detail in another class. Okay. But guidelines for writing um, um, uh, reporting, incident reports are vital to the safety of the staff and residents. So, again, we're going to cover incident reports, so we're going to skip through this a little bit. But, you know, you have to report accurately, you have to report immediately. Um, while, the, while the information is fresh in your mind, you have to, you know, write a statement as to what happened. Okay. So, again, we're going to talk more about incident reports. We have a whole class just for incident reports. As a nursing assistant, you have to know how to answer the phones because you are going to be required to answer phones at the, at the job. Um, who are the people calling? Doctors call, family call, supervisors call, sometimes the owner of the facility calls. So if you're around the phone, you pick up the phone and you must use proper telephone etiquette, okay? So for example, you're working at Greenbelt Career Institute and the phone rings. Here's how you're gonna answer the phone. Thank you for calling Greenbelt Career Institute. This is Mr. Raymond speaking, how may I help you? You identify the place of work, identify yourself and offer to help. You have to be cheerful on the phone and then listen for the person to speak. Allow the person to hang up the phone first, not you. Whoever makes the call is supposed to hang up first because they're the one that called to give information. Sometimes towards the end of the call, they remember something they forgot to inform you. So they might say, oh, hello, hello, how many times have you, you wanted to say something, hello, hello, but the person already hung up. But you're the one that made the call. So allow the person that called to hang up first. You have to know how to transfer calls to another unit. Maybe the person called by mistake, or called your unit by mistake, or the receptionist transferred the call to your unit by, by mistake. You have to be able to know how to operate the phone and, and transfer to the right uh, extension. And you can give the person the extension number if they call the wrong unit. You can say, okay, hold on, ma'am, I'm going to transfer you to extension 200. Um, that's, where you, that's where your mom is, or that's where the charge nurse is or so. And always say goodbye at the end of the call, okay? Be careful not to give information over the phone. Do not give information about coworkers. You don't know who's waiting out at the gate. If they call and say, oh, is uh, Mr. David walking today? Well, if that person knows Mr. David, they, better, they should know his cell phone number. So you can say, well, I'm sorry, I cannot give you that information today. I don't know if somebody's waiting at the gate for Mr. David. So do not give information about your coworkers. And definitely do not give information about your uh, residents. Okay. Okay. If you have to place a call on hold, just let the resident know, um, the caller know, okay, ma'am, I'm going to put you on hold uh, while I go get the charge nurse. It could be a doctor that call asking for a charge nurse. All right. Do not use your cell phone at the job. Please, please, please. Okay. What could happen if a nursing assistant give out confidential information about a resident or staff over the phone? You could have your coworker killed, or you could have somebody on the on the phone use the information for identity theft. So you never know who's calling. You also have to know that the residents' call light in their room is the way, one of the most important ways they can reach. Uh, you 
uh, for help. So make sure the call light is working. Never ever take the call light away from the residents. That will be against the law. I mean, what if they, they were about to fall and they're hanging out of the bed, but they can't call it for help. And before you know it, they're on the floor and they, they've had a fracture or, so, or other injuries. So be very careful with that. Never ignore the call light. Even if it's not a resident, the resident belongs to everyone, whether you're in maintenance or housekeeping or whoever. If you're passing by and the, light, the call light is on, you go in there and answer the light. They could just want a remote control. Maybe they need a glass of water. Something you can do, you do. But if they want to be changed or they want to go take a shower, you, you simply say, okay, I'm going to go get your CNA for you. Okay. <clears throat> rounds. When you arrive at work, you must make rounds to make sure all your residents are present, to make sure you know who and who needs help first, you know, if they have any need at the beginning of the shift. So you, that helps you to plan, to start planning your shift. <clears throat> you also have to make rounds every two hours to check on the status of your resident. Believe me, I have inherited a dead body before. I was working night shift. We got there at 11. The outgoing three to 11 shift, we both made rounds. We walk into the room. We go room by room by room. And the resident was lying there covered. At, we all thought the resident was breathing, but we didn't check to see that the resident was breathing. We just assumed he was alive and breathing, just sleeping. Well, evening shift went home at 11.30. Around two o'clock or so, the CNA went to check on the resident. The resident was dead. They came to call me, we went in there, we started CPR. You know, it doesn't matter whether they're dead or not, just start CPR if they're supposed to have CPR. So when the, we called 911, of course, 911 came and said, well, the person has been dead for over four hours. That means the person was even dead maybe around 10 o'clock when, when we were not even there yet, you know, during the evening shift. So you have to make rounds. I had another case where the resident had left the building, you know, on, on morning shift around 11 a.m. in the morning. I came to work at three o'clock. We made rounds. We thought the person was just downstairs hanging out with his friends. They didn't know that he left and went home. When it was time to give him medication, I sent the CNA to call him from downstairs. He wasn't there. We searched the whole building. He wasn't there. We called the family. Family said, oh, he's been here since 10 o'clock. This resident walked out of the reception with security, walked out of the gate with security, stood in front of the gates, there's a bus stop in front of the gates, got on the bus, went home. Nobody knew. All of us were in trouble. So be very careful to make rounds. Arrive on time, listen to your assignment, uh, get, gather your supply. <clears throat> Again, prioritize your work. And at the end of shift, you always have to <clears throat> excuse me, give report to the shift that is coming on. Good status. Good status means that a resident have formally indicated whether they will need CPR or not. If they were to have a cardiac arrest or they become unconscious, will they want CPR or not? Okay, so if they want CPR, they are considered to be full code. If they don't want CPR, then that is DNR, do not resuscitate. But we'll cover that more in another class. Code in healthcare means that we have colors, uh, like in my facility, we use colors to identify a, a, a code. For example, if we have fire, um, we're not gonna say fire, fire, we're gonna say code red, code red, code red on two south, or code red on five north. Everybody knows that that means fire. If somebody's, you know, need help, medical help, 
urgent medical help, like CPR, the announcement the code is going to be blue. Code blue on three south, code blue, you know, and then all the medical staff knows to respond to that room to, to go start CPR or to go check on the resident. All right. So on your assignment sheets, when you, you know, before you start work, you're going to have resident information, diagnosis, their code status, level of care, things like that, um, their shower schedule. We talk about prioritizing your work. So once you make rounds, you will know who needs help first, who needs help second. I'll give an example. You have three residents. You're making your rounds at the beginning of shift. First resident says to you, oh, nurse, I need to go to the bathroom when you get a chance. You said, okay, I'll be back. You go to room, the second room and the resident says, oh, when you get a chance, I need you to fold my clothes and put in the closet. You said, okay. You go to the third resident and the resident says, nurse, I'm having a chest pain. Who would you go to first? The chest pain. Who would you go to, to next? The bathroom, room one. Then when you get a chance, you can go take care of room two with the clothes to be folded. So you have to prioritize according to level of need, okay? So we talk about that, make a schedule, get your supplies. Um, <clears throat> if for any reason you cannot complete your work, always let the charge nurse know if there's any problem, okay? So that's the end of communication. I uh, hope you wrote down questions and then talk to your um, instructor when they come around. Thank you.